very good evening and a warm welcome to weekend edition of Prime Time News on TV One. We are coming to you live from the News for Studios here in Colombo. We have a comprehensive report from here on the latest developments here in Sri Lanka and across the globe. But first, let's take a look at the headlines for tonight. Prime Minister renews calls for international monetary organizations to provide debt relief for developing countries. Committee appointed to review MCC agreement recommends that the pact must not be implemented without an expert study, public discussion and approval of a majority in parliament. Director General of Health Services urges the public to adhere to and follow the quarantine laws. 14-day quarantine for anyone refusing to wear face masks. Who obtained money from the MCC compact? Complaints lodged at the National Elections Commission against election laws. NEC chairman responds to political parties. The unanswered human-elephant conflict. In your top story tonight, Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksha has renewed calls for international monetary organizations to provide debt relief for developing countries. The Prime Minister made these remarks during a meeting with representatives from the United Nations and UNICEF in Sri Lanka at Temple Trees yesterday. The UN delegation was meeting Prime Minister Rajapaksa to propose strengthening Sri Lanka's social protection system through a universal child benefit and by prioritizing the most vulnerable sectors of the population, that includes children, the elderly, people with special needs, noting that this would help families and help lessen the impact of the recession. In order to address these concerns, the Prime Minister said all developing countries will need assistance from international monetary organizations. The current crisis is causing immense strain on every nation's economy, he said, especially those of emerging and developing countries. Prime Minister Rajapaksa said organizations such as the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund should prioritize the possibility of offering such debt relief. The whole of government response is a remarkable example, said UN resident coordinator in Sri Lanka, Hana Singer, noting they, quote, appreciate the ways all governments have been responding, end quote, to the COVID-19 crisis. Sri Lanka's newest television experience, The Voice Teens, air on Sirisa TV, has reached its final stage. You are now witnessing the live broadcast of the knockouts of the show. Now, in this row, round, uh, the four judges will select 16 competitors from four teams, and out of the 16, four will be selected for the semi finals. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> छुट्टा क्या के गाये ने अनस्टेबल लूना के ला पिचिंग वाला दी सेल की उत्तर मान याक इतिंग एकात किया नॉन ई लंगटा आकिला आकिला की काठांडा मामा इतामत क्या मुझे काठांडा कर फैरनी काठांडा किला बिगिया ने इतिंग या हरियट में तोर गने तीनों या के दक्षतावे एलियट दान या टक गला बने सिंधुक इतिंग ए तोर गा� इताम होंदा टा एलियट टा दुन्ना कीने का किया नवसाई दिल में। We will bring you the results of the knockout round soon. Now, continuing with more local news, the committee appointed to review the Millennium Challenge Corporation Agreement, or the MCC, has recommenced that the pact must not be implemented without an expert study, public discussion and the approval of a majority in Parliament. The review committee had stressed that the agreement must be rejected if the Millennium Challenge Corporation Agreement does not agree to this process. The committee, headed by Professor Lalita Siri Gunavruwan, comprised D.S. Jayavira, Nihal Jayawardhana and Nalika Jayavira. In its final report, the committee had highlighted several serious matters concerning the proposed MCC agreement. 
The project that falls under the agreement would be implemented by MCA Sri Lanka. However, this institution cannot conduct itself outside the framework of U.S. laws in relation to statutory matters. Accordingly, the decision-making power of this body lies with Millennium Challenge Corporation. The ownership of all data, information and intellectual property relating to the project will also be held by MCC. The committee points out that carrying out these projects through a different company is an act that disregards the country's laws as it differs from the established procedure under which foreign funded projects are operated by the Treasury. The committee observes that the tender process pertaining to these projects also differ from the accepted system in the country. It adds that the company can leave the country in the event of any problems that may arise with respect to these projects by letting the blame fall on the shoulders of the Sri Lankan government. The report points out that Sri Lanka would fall into an inconvenient situation if such an incident occurs. According to the agreement that has been drafted, the pact must be submitted before Parliament for its approval. If parliamentary approval is granted for the agreement, certain laws in the U.S. will be implemented in the country. According to the committee, the acceptance of the agreement had been prevented due to the political situation that arose when the good governance government was on the verge of accepting it, during which the then president, Maitripala Sirisena, sacked his prime minister and appointed Mahin Rajapaksa to the post. The committee observes that agreeing upon an international agreement does not lie solely on the hands of the executive. It pointed out that such an action can dampen the independence of the people. On the same lines, the committee proposed that a clause which would require the majority consent of parliament to ink an international agreement would be included in the constitution. The review report revealed that the government in 2004 has held discussions over the MCC project and that no discussion had taken place from 2005 to 2015. However, the Daily Mirror newspaper citing the U.S. Embassy had reported that the government under Mahindra Raj Paksa had requested for the MCC grant in 2005 for the first time. The matters concerning the agreement that were continuously highlighted by News First have been reaffirmed in the report of the review committee. It is very evident that the MCC agreement disregards the country's laws and its sovereignty. However, suspicion has arisen as to whether the MCC agreement would be implemented after amending its clauses and obtaining the approval of Parliament. Two projects that include the development of the transport system and land administration have been proposed under the agreement. Among them, the land administration project has been heavily criticised in the report. The review committee revealed that during the preliminary discussions concerning the MCC agreement, attention has been drawn towards several areas including energy apart from transport and land administration. At the time of releasing its report, the US ambassador had met with the Minister of Power and has expressed the willingness of the US to support energy-related projects in the country. Our attempts still underway to secure the 480 million US dollar grant under the MCC agreement or by any other means. After the election, they will mortgage the country, make it a US colony that would house US military personnel, and sign the agreement like Nepal, conduct an SMS competition or a reality show to seek public opinion. We wish to tell the government to refrain from politically harming the people who voted for them. If the MCC agreement is not going to be signed, why are institutions that work for MCC advertising job vacancies? Why is the US ambassador issuing statements while the government is focused on COVID-19 and the election? Foreign nations cannot operate offices in Sri Lanka without the approval of the government. Why is an office operating for an agreement that is not going to be signed? If we look at the Gunuruan report, the U.S. Embassy has said that the funds have not been received by the U.S. yet. It will be a fraud only if funds have been received by the U.S. This report does not have any value to it. It is neither useful nor is it gold. I do not want to sling mud at the government, but there is one question that I wish to ask them. They must tell us directly whether they approve the MCC agreement or not, and what is the response they have given to the U.S. agreement. That is all we expect from them. I shall comment more on this later.
Meanwhile, the United National Party says the allegations leveled by the present government with regard to the MCC agreement are false. Recently, President Gotabia Rajapaksa had made a statement claiming that the USA had given 10 million during the UNP-led government. He questioned as to what happened to these funds. It is disappointing to say that the president too has started to engage in fake politics and slinging mud at others. The US embassy had clearly stated that the US government has not given any funds to the government of Sri Lanka. We all know he was a former US citizen. He must now clearly state as to whether the MCC agreement would be signed or not. When we were in power, the opposition accused us of being friendly to the US. Some even accused that we were trying to divide the country into two and give half of it to the US. They tried to win the election by making such false accusations. The US has clearly stated that the MCC was first discussed during Mahindra Rajapaksa's government. We urge the government to refrain from making such false accusations and to contest the upcoming election in a fair manner. With the handing over of the final report of the MCC Review Committee, various views are being expressed over the fund allegedly obtained during the signing of the initial agreements. We have learned that approximately $10,000 million that was received has gone missing. It is clear the previous government had signed two decisive agreements without anyone's knowledge. Cabinet approval has not been granted. As far as I know, during our government, such an agreement was not signed. However, we are not sure whether such a thing took place after we resigned from the national government. But such an agreement is not in effect. The government's stance on this will be declared soon. We will not sign any agreement that will be detrimental to our country. If any funds were received by the finance ministry, the Auditor General could easily detect this. As far as we know, we have not received such funds. This is done to mislead everyone. The MCC has not been signed. Discussions with the MCC commenced in 2002 and concluded in 2004. There was a change in government afterwards. Mahindra Rajapaksha was elected as the president who then appointed Mangala Samaravira as his foreign minister. Mangala Samaravira was then sent to the US to resume talks with the MCC. Mahindra Rajapaksha wanted to access the funds received via the MCC agreement. At that point, the MCC disagreed. It was then in 2016 the government once again resumed discussions with the MCC and it was only after three years, that is in 2019. The MCC approved the funds for Sri Lanka. I urge the government once again, make a clear public statement that the government will not sign the MCC. This is nothing but a drama targeting the elections. If they agree with the MCC agreement, they will lose votes. But they cannot disagree with it either. After the elections were over, this agreement became 70% favourable. The remaining 30% will also become favourable to the Agaman pillar after the upcoming general election. Why are they beating around the bush? Why can't they come forward and be clear that the MCC will not be signed? During the run-up to the presidential election, they stressed that they will not sign the agreement. <laughs> Claiming the previous government had already signed the obtained funds, they are trying to use this as an excuse to sign the agreement. Is this a game they are trying to play? They do not reveal the other side of the picture. How was the amount revealed? If they know the amount, they should also know from where it came or to which account it was transferred to. Who signed this? Reveal this to the general public. Do not use the harmful MCC agreement as a cheap political tool. There is a country office established and it is operational. In that case, they must state that the office will be closed within the next three months. Their intention to not sign the agreement would then be clear. This is a double game played by the government. Director General of Health Services Dr. Anil Singh has said, that the quarantine regulations must continue to be implemented in the country. During a media briefing today, Dr. Jasing has said the people must abide by quarantine regulations to prevent a second wave of COVID-19 along with the reopening of airports. 
அதவன விட அப்பே ஸ்ரீலங்கா பூமிய துலின் அப்பே சிட்டின ஜனதாவ துலின் கோவிட் 19 ரோகின் ஹமுவன்னே நே தோ அப்பட அட் பிரசன்ட் கோவிட் 19 கேसेस ஆர் நாட் பீங் டிடெக்டட் வித் இன் தி கம்யூனிட்டி ஹவேவர் திஸ் இஸ் நாட் எ சிச்சுவேஷன் டு सेलिब्रेट விக்டரி கன்சர்னிங் கோவிட் 19 This is because countries like Germany, New Zealand and Singapore are now facing the risk of a resurgence in cases. We issued 46 guidelines amidst the COVID-19 pandemic and also towards the end of it. These guidelines targeted three main factors that include social distancing, respiratory etiquette and cleansing our hands. However, nowadays we can observe that the people, institutions or individuals who hold power have not paid much attention to these guidelines. One can question as to why these guidelines must be respected if the virus is not in the country. However, the virus has re-emerged in countries that are more developed than ours as the community had not followed the guidelines. We saw that facilities had been set up outside institutions to keep one's hand clean. However, nowadays at least soap liquid cannot be seen in some places. Our main target is to prevent the transmission of the virus within the community along with the reopening of airports. To do that, we need to maintain the changes that we have implemented. If people are entering the country through airports, the best course of action would be to subject them to quarantine. However, we know that tourists will not come to the country to undergo quarantine. Therefore, we will have to implement new tools to protect the tourist industry and to prevent the transmission of the virus from foreigners to the local community. Even if we manage to reap success through these new methods, the success would be complete only if the people maintain discipline. We have opened up our country much quicker than the other countries to support the country's economy and the people. Otherwise people will have to face other problems. However, we will reopen the doors to our country in a cautious manner. Therefore, the responsibility of curbing the threat lies on the society as a whole. To tot e nisa e da avadanama avama kara ganime waga kiyama samastha janathawata himi wenawa. Meanwhile, head of the Presidential Task Force for the Prevention of COVID-19, Army Commander Lieutenant General Shavendra Silva, called on the Mahanayakas of the Malwatu and Askiri chapters this morning and explained the COVID-19 situation in the country. April this when them passe asaditian amu no una tamaje tula me ratata raje vishin apage new covid 19 cases were not detected within the community since the 30th of april however the numbers continued to rise as new cases were detected among the sri lankans who were repatriated from foreign nations such individuals were directed to quarantine centers as there is a possibility of interacting with other individuals we cannot be certain that covid 19 can be eradicated from sri lanka the general public must continue to adhere to the health guidelines specified by the health ministry we witness how certain factions refuse to wear face masks and practice social distancing they behave as if there was no covid-19 at all this is a very dangerous situation even though there are no covid-19 cases reported within the community there are active cases under medical supervision at hospitals Meanwhile police said individuals who refuse to wear face masks will be directed to self quarantine for 14 days senior dig in charge of the western province deshabandha tenokun said this measure will be implemented starting from tomorrow We can see how certain individuals are evading from adhering to the health guidelines specified by the Ministry of Health. Yesterday, we inspected 19,665 individuals within the Western Province alone. 6,725 of them were not wearing face masks. We let them go after strictly advising them to wear a face mask. We have informed all police stations to look into this matter and ensure everyone wears a face mask and adheres to quarantine regulations. These operations will commence from tomorrow. No one can escape as we will place a notice on the front door of their respective houses. Those who violate instructions will be compelled to undergo self quarantine for 14 days. We urge the general public do not violate the health rules and regulations. Meanwhile, police media spokesperson SSP Jalya Sena Ratna addressing a media briefing this afternoon expressed the following views on wearing face masks. There is no need to wear it inside the car, but we expect the mask to be worn when getting down from the vehicle and while going to a public space.
When riding a motorcycle in an open area and when there is no one else in that area, there is no problem. However, in those open areas, people gather and you might come across other people. Therefore, face masks must be worn. The Director General of Health Services has issued several guidelines for election meetings. Accordingly, a maximum of 100 people can attend one meeting depending on the situation of the venue. So the numbers can be even less. Everyone must follow those health guidelines. Dr. Jude Jayama, consultant virologist at the Department of Biology of the Medical Research Institute, says there is a risk of COVID-19 spreading within society at any given time. Then, may virus win a sakti no the mukakari. Virus again of Badano, virus, Saran Sareta Tamagi, Anuka Surupia, Ajana Mesurupia, Venaskaragana. This virus changes its genetic makeup regularly. However, it has not drastically changed as yet. However, it continues to grow through increased infections. We must always be one step ahead. Even though new cases were not identified within the society, we cannot be certain that the virus has been eradicated from our country. The risk of the virus spreading still prevails as there is a global outbreak. We must always be vigilant and careful. Earlier on our bulletin, we brought you the views expressed by the Director General of Health about reopening airports. Now, an exact date for the reopening of airports for incoming traffic is yet to be confirmed. Sharing his views with News First, President of the Sri Lanka Inbound to Operators speaks of grey areas that needs to be clarified prior to reopening Sri Lanka for tourists. Of course, the priority has to be the health of the nation. Authorities will make the correct decision at the correct time as to when Sri Lanka could be open for international tourism. And also the protocols uh, to be followed for the tourists coming into Sri Lanka has to be more clearer. Uh, there are some grey areas in this connection. Going forward, I think also Sri Lanka should look at opening a few corridors with some of the countries that are least affected by the pandemic, like Korea, China, and even as far as UK, where they are having preferred uh, nation status for the travel of their citizens. So I think we should start talking to these foreign governments uh, for having Sri Lanka in their list of safe countries to travel. Uh, and at the same time, also educate the Sri Lankans, the locals, uh, how to be more receptive towards the foreigners once tourism starts. Former trial attorney at the Hague's International Criminal Tribunal and President's Counsel Andra Madde Goda said Vinayagamurthy Muralidharan, alias Karuna Aman, LTT's renegade leader turned politician, should be tried for war crimes. Speaking to Daily Mirror, Senior Counsel Anuna Maddegoda said the Sri Lankan government must complain to Hague's United Nations International Criminal Tribunal for the crimes militant turned politician has committed against humanity. The senior attorney said there are a number of instances where Karuna Amman alleged to have committed murder and crimes that fall under the category of war crimes and crimes against humanity. During the interview, he said, quote, if Karuna says he did it in the cause of the conflict, which he said to have stated in a statement in Ampara, it is imperative that the law enforcement authorities conduct an investigation into that statement, end quote. He went on to note that, quote, what is not a crime in the cause of conflict is called collateral damage. But if innocent Buddhist monks were killed, that is not collateral damage, but deliberate murder, end quote. The senior attorney said that the Sri Lankan government can make a complaint. He concluded the interview saying, quote, let's see what the statement is and see what further action this government would take on this matter, end quote. Meanwhile, various views were expressed on the political platform regarding the remarks made by Karuna Amman. I vehemently oppose it. 
I wish to clearly state that legal action must be taken against that remark. It is wrong even if Karuna Amman's parents had made that remark. It is wrong regardless of who said it. Premadasa offered support to that terrorist and murdered our brave soldiers. 650 police officers were killed after asking them to come back. Did the LTTE remain idle from 1975 to 1989? They're speaking about giving weapons. If we are to comment about the financial support given by... According to the revelations made by Sri Pati Suryarachi, the money was given to the LTTE. Where are those money? Weren't security personnel attacked using those funds from 2005 to 2009? They are trying to garner votes by reigniting matters that are as old as 20 or 30 years. He himself has said it. The problem in a war is that we cannot find out who the killers are. But Karuna is saying that he killed 3,000 people. Therefore, where is the CID, the police and the judiciary? We wish to state responsibly that this is a serious crime in the country. Remove the field marshal position from Sarath Fonseca and the title of admiral of the fleet of Karan Nagwada and hand them over to Karuna Amman, Daya Master and KP. It seems they have done the job. We say that Karuna stirred up this controversy based on the current situation. The Sinhalese can be offended by a certain remark made by Karuna Amman. However, this will give them the upper hand of obtaining the votes of the Tamil. That is what they are trying to do. When he makes such a remark at this time, they arrested him and released him the next day, like they did to KP. Therefore, he is tightening the grip on both sides. There is some new drama now. Mark my word, this is how the drama would be played out. During a meeting in Madrigiria, I said that he would be brought to the CID. As I predicted, he was brought to the CID the next day. He didn't go during the first two days. Let me tell you another thing that will happen. He will be remanded two weeks before the election. There are fridges, telephones, beds and food inside prisons. They will give him enough luxuries for two weeks and keep him inside. What will happen then? The henchmen of the ruling party will then boast about landing him in prison. They will keep him there for two weeks. Then the people in the north will feel that Karuna had gone to prison by speaking on behalf of us and they will vote for him. This is how they will carry out their election campaigning. This is the bitter truth. Meanwhile, views also expressed regarding Kumaran Padmanathan, alias KP, who is believed to have managed the international network of the LTTE. The election is on the 5th of August. We can see that the government has a plan to organize a massive media circus in mid-July and imprison Karuna Amman for a week until the end of the poll. However, we got used to these media circuses. They conduct a similar circus on the verge of the presidential election in 2015. Kumaran Patmanadam, or KP, was the treasurer of the Tigers. He was brought from Malaysia. It was KP who was in charge of the treasury of the LTTE that had millions and billions of dollars in it. He was brought to the country. But what did the Rajapaksa government do to KP? Where is he today? No one speaks about these funds now. This is what will happen to Karuna Amman as well. They might keep him in remand for a couple of weeks to mesmerize the people before releasing him after the election. We strongly condemn this shameful attempt to deceive the people. This government conducts circuses. To do that, it used the Criminal Investigations Department. These days, it is being carried out using Karuna Amman. He is the subject of discussion today. We have forgotten about KP. When they go to England, they cite certain buildings as those which sheltered the LTTE. It was KP who was in charge of all these facilities. It was he who created them. They orchestrated a circus at the airport after bringing him to the country, stating that he has been arrested by the LTTE. However, where is KP now? Where is KP's prison cell? Where are these assets that were confiscated from KP? If they were confiscated, when were they brought to the treasury? None of these details are being revealed. KP's money might be in seashells. What happened to his money? It is the second phase of this circus that is being carried out using Karuna. They are trying to deceive the Sinhalese people by recording a statement from him at the CID. This government has killed war heroes 
he acted as a terrorist. If a terrorist admits that he killed our war heroes, there is no need to present him before the CID. You can take this up in courts and issue a verdict in three days. They don't do that. This is an episode. What they're trying to do is to arrest Karuna Amman when the election nears. As soon as the election is over, they will release him. They will arrest him and make sure that they tell the people of this country that he has been arrested although he was considered to be one of us because we will not let anyone disrespect our war heroes. This is what they're trying to achieve through this episode. The people must understand this. They don't have to present him to the CID. They can simply hand him over to the state intelligence and put him to jail. But they can take up the case in courts within 24 to 48 hours hours. Instead, they have created this episode. So we ask the people not to fall for this. Sri Lanka's election headquarters, where key political movers and shakers are seen and heard, where party stalwarts and fresh faces are equal, where statements are made. And leadership emerges where partnerships are established and destinies decided. Only news first. Sri Lanka's election headquarters. News first. A public rally of the Samadhi Janabala Vege was held in Beth Kumbhakada, Kalutara, yesterday. The public rally was organized by the party's Kalutara district organizer Ajit P. Pereira. The public rally was graced by its chief guest, leader of the Samagi Jana Balavegya, Sajit Prevadasa. The public rally was attended by several candidates and senior members of the Samagi Jana Balavegya. <laughs> The government said they will provide concessionary loans for small and medium enterprises at an interest rate of 4%. However, these promises are not being implemented. I state with responsibility that on the 5th, we will establish a government and ensure this loan scheme will be implemented within 24 hours. War heroes return to the country to make a difference. But what has happened now? <laughs> Their families voted for the flower bud. They have been abandoned. They are sleeping on pavements. This government does not care. Party leader Sajid Premadasa left the meeting amidst a cheerful farewell from the crowd. Meanwhile, a youth meeting of the Samagijana Balavege was held at the party office in Kolonava under the patronage of party leader Sajid Premadasa. The meeting had been organized by Kolonava electorate organizer S.M. Marikar. The youth of this country cannot keep repeating their mistakes. Once you pass the age of 60, you cannot work in the state or private sector. Why is that? That is due to memory loss, the decline in activeness and the drop in innovative skills. Therefore, they are kept at home while being paid a pension. However, using the taxes that you pay while purchasing a kilo of rice, 250 grams of tea leaves and 250 grams of sugar, people who are over the age of 70 can also enter parliament to govern the country. We look at countries like France and New Zealand and brand them as developed nations. That is because their leaders are young. The old crowd is only with us. Mahindra Rajapaksa conducted several television programs to mark 50 years in parliament. Out of these 50 years, he had served for 10 years as president, 3 years as prime minister and 20 years as a minister. He is now seeking a mandate to build the country at the age of 76 while he can't even walk, although he had failed to do that all these years. Our former leader served as party leader for 26 years and formed two governments. Once he allowed Satosa to be looted and during the second occasion he allowed the massive theft of the central bank to take place while urging party supporters to tighten their belts. The people didn't have jobs, houses, deeds or some of the allowances. 
At the age of 72, he is saying that he will start a new journey with the party supporters. What sort of a joke is this? Therefore, there is only one leader in the political sphere who understands the feelings of the youth, the supporters and the poor. And that is none other than the 53-year-old Sajid Premadasa. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sajid Premadasa and Harin Fernando met with the Archbishop of Colombo, His Eminence Malcolm Cardinal Ranjit, in Colombo today. Adadina Mamat Harin Fernando Amatetumat Atiutritara Cardinal. Harin Fernando and I had a cordial discussion with His Eminence Malcolm Cardinal Ranjit today. We discussed several matters that were linked to misunderstandings and confusions, and we have now reached the right point. We have immense respect for His Eminence and value his advice. Harin Fernando agrees in the same manner. We appreciate the invaluable service rendered by His Eminence to the people of this country. We are all committed to support the Catholic community in carrying out their activities. In light of the COVID-19 outbreak, the central bank now stands ready to provide a further 120 billion rupees at a concessionary rate to commercial banks for on lending to affected businesses. However, analysts point out that the local banking sector faces severe challenges in adhering to central bank and government regulations as they do not have the proper guarantees to mitigate the risk involved. In response to the COVID-19 outbreak, the central bank launched a refinance facility to promote economic activity in the country. Under this refinancing facility, the central bank approved 13,861 loan applications totaling 27.9 billion rupees, out of which licensed banks have already dispersed 14.8 billion rupees among 7,274 affected businesses. Since late February this year, the central bank has injected approximately 459 billion rupees into the banking system to maintain sufficient levels of liquidity. With the recent uh, SRR cut, we have come across a significant amount of liquidity in the uh, market at the moment. Liquidity is uh, in excess of uh, 200, 200 billion rupees. The main idea of the SRR cut is to push banks to do lending. However, at this moment of time, uh, in a situation where uh, SMEs are struggling, some of the big businesses are also struggling, fear levels have significantly uh, increase for banks going all out into the market and lending is a significant uh, risky factor. Look at the NPL levels are significantly higher now moving towards somewhere in the range of what we saw in uh, 2008 surpassed the 7% uh, mark probably towards the end of the year. We don't think that the banks are likely to uh, significantly lend uh, into the market without such a uh, credit guarantee scheme. So it's much less riskier for them to protect their capital and whatever money that is uh, released in the system, uh, they will more look at uh, parking it in uh, either treasury bills or bonds. Rating agency Fitch expects bad loans at banks rated by the agency to peak at 13.2% in 2021 after rising to 10.9% from the current 9.4%. Bad loans rose to 4.7% of gross loans by end 2019 from 3.4% a year earlier. Fitch expects asset quality to deteriorate for all banks in 2020 and 2021 with a more pronounced decline for banks with higher exposure to SMEs and the more affected corporate sectors such as tourism, apparel and retail. Fitch also believes the near-term extent of the deterioration will be masked by the repayment moratoriums and regulatory permission for banks to apply flexibility in impairment recognition for regulatory and financial reporting. While banks locally face a high risk of rising NPLs, the reliability of local banks in the international arena has also been challenged following the import restrictions imposed by the government to prevent the sharp depreciation of Sri Lanka's currency. The government brought in certain exchange controls 
uh, particularly with regard to the payment terms restricting payments to the estab- uh, establishment of lc documents on uh, documents against payment and documents against acceptance only and uh, not allowing open uh, payment so as a result uh, there were certain operations particularly the commodity like affected items had an impact because most of it was traded on open account secondly the payment terms uh, through lc bp and ba were restricted uh, to long credit 90 days then subsequently 120 and 180 days requirement so what that means is that we uh, the importers had to ask the suppliers for extended credit which is a very difficult uh, situation for people to ask for 6 months credit so the price of the goods that were imported went up and uh, similarly the uh, measures that were taken and communicated created a lot of uh, uh, uncertainty in the international trading community and the insurer uh, international insurers particularly the export insurers on those countries uh, brought in added surcharges and the uh, export insurance premium had gone up The water project that was initiated for home gardening in Galgamur Palwa has been dysfunctional for over a year. The villagers claim that a cost of 2 million rupees had been incurred on this project. The project which began last year is now inactive. It has been abandoned without a proper mode of water. It has become an obstruction to daily farming activities of the locals in the area. There are 136 types of crops. It's been a year. Nothing happened to the project. I water the plants five times a day. Even though the public has no use from this project, millions have already been spent. This was started through the Usana scheme. However, as of now, about 2 million has been spent. The canal was constructed for 750 meters. More than 750 meters of pipes are installed below the ground, but it can't even provide water to this area. This is a small problem. All we ask is for water to cover at least 750 meters of this land. Villagers are requesting the authorities to provide a solution to this issue. Those who work tirelessly during the day and are deprived of sleep at night no longer have trust in the false promises made by authorities. Locals residing in Munragala and the situation there is one of the many examples. Locals in Munragala have been deprived of sleep for years. Last night a herd of elephants had encroached the Gomadiyavala village in Vallavaya doing much destruction to its properties and cultivations. Fortunately at that time this house was empty the stock of paddy and peanuts that were sorted for consumption were all eaten by these elephants my mother was sick and i was at her place it has been 8 months since my husband passed away i live here with my daughter we would have been killed last night fortunately no one was here while elephants in kotra village we urge the authorities to solve this problem Approximately 3000 locals of the Gomadiyavela, Alutvela, Ussella, Kandayana and Veerayaya villages whose livelihood is cultivation continue to struggle because of wild elephants. Meanwhile locals of Rambeva in the 104 Medagama area in Tulana are also victims to the ongoing human elephant conflict wild elephants from the Vilpattu forest reserve who encroach their village return to their territories after destroying the cultivations of these villages spread across 1600 acres of land This is another herd of elephants in Talava Anuradhapura A bear that was spotted in Puthuvil this morning was captured and sedated and was later released to the wild. The bear had appeared in the areas close to Puthuvil this morning at 9 a.m. and had come from a forest nearby. The area residents informed the officers of the Lahugala Wildlife Office on this matter. Yeah. 
The operation to sedate the bear began thereafter. Afterwards, the bear was sedated under the supervision of the wildlife veterinary surgeon of Ampara district after it was found hiding in a garden close by. The wildlife authority stated that the eight-year-old bear was released to the Kumana Reserve. <laughs> A dead dolphin had been washed off to the Panadara beach this morning. According to our correspondent, a dolphin was spotted by the police life-saving officers and afterwards they were informed by the Department of Coast Conservation. Around five feet in length, the dolphin had a large wound close to its spinal cord. Our correspondent stated that it had been revealed that the dolphin had died three days prior before being washed off the shore. We want a clean parliament. We want a clean government. Think before you vote. Journalists questioned the chairman of the National Election Commission on the remarks being expressed by politicians regarding election laws. The National Election Commission has only implemented an existing law in the Act and not implemented a new law. We might have implemented the law in a wrong manner so far. However, once an error is rectified, there is no need to repeat the error again. We are sending them to every household. The list of candidates along with their serial numbers is sent to every home. If the candidate has earned fame by working and if the people know that he is suitable, they will find out his number. However, we accept that there is a small issue for candidates who are not popular. Therefore, they can dispatch a three-member team to distribute their manifesto and their number among every household. Otherwise, they can communicate this information orally by organizing small meetings with a maximum of 100 participants. We haven't prepared the laws. The laws have been prepared by Parliament. Therefore, there is nothing that we can do about it at the moment. A trial for counting of votes prior to the upcoming general election was held today at the Kurunagala Divisional Secretariat's office. The trial for counting of votes for the upcoming general election was held today adhering to specified health guidelines. The trial event was attended by the chairman of the Sri Lanka Medical Council, Dr. Indika Karunathilaka, Kurunagala District Deputy Election Commissioner, Dilip Nishanta, and Kurunagala District Returning Officer, R. Ratnayaka. During the counting of votes, steps were taken to disinfect the premises every hour. News First correspondent said 8,000 ballot papers were counted during today's trial event. Melinda Moragoda, founder of the Pathfinder Foundation and former cabinet minister, called on political parties to clearly state their positions on the provincial council system in their policy platforms for the forthcoming general elections. He urges parties to consider repealing the 13th Amendment, thereby abolishing the provincial council system. Morogada reiterated his earlier proposal that the provincial council should be abolished and power be directly devolved to empowered and reconfigured the local, urban and municipal councils since these bodies operate closest to the citizenry and are thus in a better position to address and solve community level problems. He argued that although the original intent of the 13th Amendment, enacted in 1987, was to create more provincial autonomy in order to help address Sri Lanka's ethnic problem, instead this structure has proven to be superfluous, expensive, diverse and fraught with inefficiency. 
He added that the provincial council system cost Sri Lanka over 250 billion rupees annually and there is little doubt that significant saving and improved efficiency can be achieved through the abolition of this dysfunctional mechanism. Foreign outflows from stocks crossed 20 billion rupees for the first six months of 2020. The all share price index was up by 3.5% and the S&P SL20 was up by 6.3% for the week as yields were at historically low levels with massive liquidity injections from the central bank. During the previous week, the rupee depreciated against the US dollar by 2.6%. Earnings from exports declined by 25.9% to 2,932 million US dollars during the first four months of 2020 as a result of low earnings from exports. And CPI based headline inflation declined to 5.2% in May of 2020 from 5.9% in April of 2020. During the week, crude oil prices showed a mixed performance. In the beginning of the week, prices mainly rose due to tighter crude oil supplies from major producers. However, prices largely showed a decline trend after the U.S. crude stockpile grew more than expected. At the end of the week, prices temporarily increased on optimism after recovering worldwide fuel demand. Overall, Brent and WTI prices declined by $1 per barrel and $0.83 cents per barrel, respectively, during the period. More than 9.9 .9 million people around the world have been diagnosed with COVID-19, while 5.4 million people have recovered. Worldwide, more than 497,000 people have died due to COVID-19. According to foreign media, the United States recorded at least 40,870 new COVID-19 cases yesterday, the largest single-day increase of the pandemic. The state of New York has the highest amount of COVID-19 cases, with a reported number of 415,207 and 31,421 deaths due to COVID-19. California recorded a total of 206,811 confirmed cases, with 5,872 deaths. The U.S. currently has 2 million 553,068 COVID-19 cases and 127,640 deaths with 1,068,768 recoveries so far. With over 1 million registered cases of the coronavirus and 53,830 deaths, Brazil has risen to the charts as a global hotspot for the pandemic with the second highest number of cases and fatalities after the United States. The state of Maharashtra has the highest number of COVID-19 cases in India. India has more than 500,000 confirmed coronavirus cases, with a record daily leap of 18,500 new infections. India's confirmed coronavirus cases cross half a million today, with another record 24-hour jump of 18,552 infections. Former Sri Lankan Test cricket captain Arjuna Ranatunga has urged the sports minister to draw his attention towards match fixing in local matches. I remember the report prepared by Palita Kumara Singha. If the sports minister studied this report, he can observe how the outcome of match between two cricket clubs have been influenced. This report has been swept under the carpet as it involves certain individuals in the cricket administration. We saw that the fixtures of the T20 tournament has also been changed. The tournament has been prepared to allow the club of the chairman and another club of the district chairman to enter the finals. These must be investigated. Steps must be taken to stop match fixing in Sri Lanka. I have been reiterating this since 2001. However, any administration did not want to look into this matter. If we do not want to adopt a legal course of action, it is not just the sports but the country that would be destroyed along with it. The game of cricket is close to the people, similar to a religion. However, the game has been distanced from the people. The time has come to put an end to all of this. <laughs> Now, an update from The Voice Teens. Two judges chose to competitors to take the next step on The Voice Teens ad on Sirisa TV. Judge Dumal Varnakulasurya chose Vinat Satsara, while Judge Raini Gunatilaka chose Dilmi Sachnika from the knockout round. It's crossover to the moment where the judges made their final decision today. Mama, <laughs> Congratulations, Vina! Manga.
Isaragin in our Dilmi. Congratulations, Dilmi! And that's all the news we have for you tonight. All for the news first team, and Zinat Musafa and tonight's news interpreter, was Tarika Gabriel. We leave you tonight with another rendition of the Nagatini Sri Lanka song, presented by the Palmadula Gulf County Central College students. Thank you and good night. <laughs> Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka.